to have you here. Delighted to have you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Rita Moon Sammy. I'm going to be your host and the moderator this evening. And I'm I'm happy that you're here at our second of four sessions in our fall chat fest, we call it, a series of online conversations with sustainability activists. Our sessions are scheduled every Tuesday through the end of October, which means we have several left. Uh, the next conversations will be on October 17th, Culturally Relevant Healthcare Delivery with Max alumni Cecilia Ottenweiler. I don't know, some of you may know her. She graduated just a couple of years ago. She'll facilitate a conversation with Max alumni, Felicia Louise, who's a doula and a certified health education specialist in Baltimore, also a recent graduate of Max, and Dr. Andrea Karakostas, who's the CEO of the Asian Health Coalition in Houston, Texas. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, October 14th, we're going to have an information session about the MAX program here at Gardu College. So if you aren't already in, um, enrolled in um, MAX and are interested in it, then you can join us then and uh, meet some, uh, hear about the courses, meet some of our faculty, and learn about some of the careers, the kinds of careers that our students achieve, um, which you will find are incredibly diverse. Our students come from so many different fields. That's part of what makes it so wonderful for an instructor, everything that at least I think I can learn. Um, Taylor, who you met, is going to post links into the chat, and she's gonna post a link to the MAX program and she's going to post a link to the page where you will find the description of the fall series of um, these free webinars. And you can sign up now if you wanna get them on your calendar. I'm also really happy and excited to welcome and talk with Dr. Psyche williams forson because I've been teaching a course on food waste. For those of you who don't know me, or who aren't taking the food waste course. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. I originated the course in Max. Um, and tonight's theme, Reciprocal Impacts, Food Ways and Environments, is resonance, resonant of what my food waste course deals with. That is the complexi complexity of the sociocultural environments surrounding and permeating um, human involvement with food. And I'm going to ask Dr. Forson Williams, uh, Williams Forson, please excuse me, Psyche. I just better call you Psyche. I told myself when I kept getting it mixed up, I should just think of it like a man's name, William Forson. And that's worked pretty well until now. Um, so before we begin, there are a few quick reminders. First of all, closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, also know that we were, are recording. Uh, and so if you prefer not to be on screen, then just turn off your video. However, I have to add from myself anyway, it's really lovely to see your faces, especially if you do speak during um, the conversation. Um, please keep your microphone on mute and your setting on speaker view until we open up for questions and discussion, and then you can take it off of speaker view and um, do the whole the whole uh, group of people on your screen if you want. Um, remember that this is designed as a conversation uh, with some opening remarks and then a moderated dialogue. So please feel free and encouraged to communicate with each other using the chat function but hold your questions. That is, you can talk to each other by chat, but please hold any questions you have for Psyche um, until we open it up for dialogue. Any questions on any of that? All right, you've probably heard it before. Now, our guest, Dr. Psyche Williams-Forson is a scholar of African-American 
life, and culture, who discusses everything from African-American foodways to the importance of food in workplaces and the meanings of Juneteenth, Juneteenth beyond food. She has spoken extensively on topics such as food and literature, food and sustainability, race, food, and design thinking. I want to hear more about design thinking, eating, um, food and uh, eating workplace cultures, eating and workplace cultures. Uh, those of you who read her, the articles, um, no, there's specifically an anecdote in one of the articles about eating and workplace cultures, as well as the way that black people's race and gender have been continuously misrepresented in visual and textual media. She's curated two exhibits, Fire and Freedom, for the National Institutes of Health and the National Library of Medicine, and um, Still Cooking by the Fireside, African Americans in Food Service, which is an online exhibition, which we'll have to be sure we look at now, that examined African American history from the colonial era to the present. She's also the author of one of my favorite books, The Building, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, Black Women, Food, and Power, and Also Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America. And she's the co-editor and, and author of A Cultural a Redefining, a Redefining Food Waste in a Changing World. And I am also eager to hear her talk about that and what the redefinition would entail. That's obviously very important for us. Uh, an author of a cultural, she's a cultural historian who studies objects and material culture. Dr. Psyche is at work on a new research project that explores um, class consumption and citizenship by looking at African-American domestic workers and interiors, excuse me, from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. She holds a BA from the University of Virginia and an MA and PhD in American Studies from the University of Maryland College Park. So now I'd like to ask Psyche to tell us about herself, some of your background, what you let, what led you to where you are as a scholar and a person. Great, thank you very much. And thank you all for having me and to all of you for joining me tonight for this um, for this chat. So I, I I see a lot of people have their um, video off and that's fine. I totally get it. You might be cooking and doing other things while, while we're chatting, but feel free. Um, I would like for this to be a conversation and not like a lecture and then, you know, because I can get through everything I have to get through. Um, uh, but just ask me questions and offer comments and things as we as we go through. So I understand many of you are in an MA program, I think. Uh, some of you may be in an MA program. I, um, as, as you know, Rita said, I went to the University of Virginia. Then I went back home to rural Virginia um, and lived for two years where I got my start in student affairs. Um, working in res life and as again as Rita mentioned when I talked about there's a I, I there's a story I tell about workplaces and eating and it came from that experience working in student affairs when I lived in Connecticut for a short time all this to say while I was there I was working with students a, a lot of students um, who would come to me because as on a predominantly white in, uh, campus when you're a person of color um, you you become a mentor of everything I was in res life, but all of a sudden I was also become became a tutor for many of the undergrads, and you know you become a, a, a you you have a whole mentorship role. I was telling Rita earlier when we were talking. I used to be at McDaniel College right up the road. For some of you who may be in the D, in the Baltimore area, you know, it used to be Western Maryland, then they changed the name to McDaniel. So I was up there for five years, and the same thing kind of happened. So anyhow. I was helping students with their papers and I got to a point where I was like, you know, I can't help you anymore because I don't know any more than you do. I'm just a couple of years out of undergrad. So I decided to go back to graduate school. 
when I decided to do that in 1991, I um, applied to American Studies and a couple of um, MA programs and, and at least one or so PhD programs because we didn't have the internet back then. But we had a book that told you about various graduate programs in the US and, and I read up on it and I was like, oh, there's something called American Studies. I like what they do. They do popular culture, material culture, so forth. So the importance of the 90s, the early 90s, is it was a water, what we call a watershed moment in black feminist thought. That means there was a lot going on around black feminist thought. Um, authors and activists at Kitchen Table Press were releasing a number of uh, works by black women. For example, um, all the women are white, all the men are black, but some of us are brave. Um, you had the work of um, various historians who were coming out reclaiming and retelling stories about black women and their role in the community of slave of the enslaved. Um, Alice Walker, was writing at that time. She had just come out with In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. She had also just reclaimed a scholar by the name of Zora Neale Hurston, who some of you may have heard of. She's an anthropologist who specialized in black folk life. So all of this was going on. I, in coming to graduate school, was taking courses around black women, on and about black women in literature, in American studies and so forth. And I came upon a novel by an African-American woman, who, which was written in, in the 1900s. There was a series of books that had been, um, I, I don't know if this is going to work because it's, it, but anyhow, there's a series of books because I have a blurred screen um, that were republished by the New York Public Library, Oxford University Press, um, and the Schomburg Library of, uh, the Schomburg Library, which is the, the premier African-American uh, library in the country for African-American uh, research. They had republished these 19th century Black women's books, and I was reading one called Contending Forces. It's the story of an African-American family, a mother, her son, and her daughter up in Boston. And at the center of the story, is a boarding house, which was run by the uh, matriarch of that family. And they had a variety of borders. Why is this significant and important to this conversation around food? Because Pauline Hopkins takes a lot of care, as material culturalists, you'll appreciate this. She takes a lot of care to give you the details of the interior design of the house. So it's not just about the political activities that takes place, but she gives you the furnishings. She talks about doilies. She talks about coat racks. Um, she tells you about the wallpaper. She also has a scene where a number of the members of the house who attend a particular house of worship participate in a church fair. And she goes through and she tells you what, each person was trying to win who sold the most tickets and how that process took place. And at the center of that elaborate discussion is the fact that the winner of selling whoever sold the most tickets would be winning the piano. That's the genesis for my next project on domestic interiors because I started with an interest in the piano. Okay, here's where the food comes in. One of the women who's trying to win the top prize sends to the South by a friend. She sent a friend to the South to get her an opossum. She wants to cook a possum dinner and sell the dinners only to the white participants because she knows they'll pay more and she's a Southern cook. She's building off the stereotype and she's not using chicken though, she's using opossum. Well, she does this and she shuts everybody out, including the pastor of the church and she sells her tickets and ultimately she loses the contest. 
So there's a lot to be read in there using the material world, right? Um, first of all, it's fascinating that somebody wanted to win a tea set. And so they put a, uh, um, a, um, a sideboard on layaway in anticipation of winning the tea set. Somebody else wanted to win the watch. Somebody else wanted to win, um, I think, some, some, some jewelry. And then there was the piano, which is the ultimate prize. So I began to wonder about the symbol of the piano. Well, that's part of the next project, the importance of the piano in relation to Black communities and how it signifies refinement and decorum and knowledge and skill and patience. And that's another presentation that I'll do at another time, right? But what oh, captured good. my attention, uh -huh, but what captured my attention was the possum. So I said, huh, I never heard that black people, you know, do this whole thing with possum. Well, okay, around that same time or within about, so I, I kept that in the back of my mind. I was really more at that time I was working on my MA, I was working on black women's alternative spaces of power. And I read in that novel, the sewing, they have a sewing circle and that became the alternative space of power. And I talked more about that in my MA. All right, then I, be, I, I got admitted into the PhD program because I decided, hey, I wanna keep studying this stuff, but I wanna study specifically material culture, <laughs> but I wanna do it through the lens of black women. So I went back to the opossum and I internet it because back then we didn't have Google. I just went to the internet and I said, possum. No, 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 I didn't do that. I'm sorry. I started just working on understanding material culture, right? Reading um, uh, um, Igor Kapitov, The Social Life of Things. Um, I familiarized myself with um, work of Bernie Herman, John Vlatch, who did enslaved uh, built environment. Um, all the folks at the Smithsonian who've talked about, you know, who talk about things, um, Arhuna Potterai, right? The social life of things, you know, so I'm reading all this stuff to understand about um, what it means to study the material world. Now you all aren't head nodding your heads around this material culture stuff because I may be in an earlier generation than you all in terms of who you're reading now. But back then, for example, um, I, was doing the work of, uh, I really am enamored by the work of Barbara Carson, who used to be in our program, um, because she has an article, it's very old, but her method is tried and true. And her article is called History from Things, interpreting history from objects, history from things, right? So I'm doing this, I'm a TA in Intro to Material Culture at University of Maryland. And I started researching for who was then a professor, a Jewish historian named Hasia Diner. And she was studying, she had me working on a project that involved Jewish peddlers and their food and um, and food ways. And I was like, food ways? I've never heard, what is that? I know, I've never heard that word. Do black people have something called food ways, right? So I started looking up food ways. Again, I went to the internet, the internets back then looked up food ways and what popped up for me were a number of African-American cookbooks. Okay, interesting. Because I'm like, yes, 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 I know what black people eat. What I don't know is why. Why are these foods associated with black people? These specific foods. Okay, one of those foods, I was looking through a, a cookbook that I had been given that I didn't even know it was the treasure that it was and that's Verda Mae Grosner's um, vibration cooking. And the late Vertebrae Grosvenor talks about how Black people cook from vibration. She's like, we don't have to measure anything. We don't measure anything because we, we go by how it feels, right? She also had a recipe in that book for possum and taters. So here it is now some maybe two years later, I happen to be looking through this cookbook and I'm like, oh my God, I really didn't know Black people ate possum. So then I wrote this article or paper for a conference called Power in the Opossum, right? And I talk about this, this, this article. Okay, so fast forward. Now I know I'm, I'm interested in Black food culture. I've been writing about material culture and their absence of discussing a food and Black food culture in specific. 
one of the only articles, well, there are a couple. Um, there's a book out there called Regional and Ethnic Foodways. It's old, but it's a classic. And if you're interested in food, it's a great book. And it deals with a lot of ethnicities, but it doesn't deal with race, okay? Um, and I was reading a lot of Patricia Turner in, in areas of folklore about black collectibles and things of this nature. And I'm telling you this because my material culture background was pretty much self-made. I trained with a scholar at Maryland who was a specialist in the built environment, but who did not know food. So it was a brand new area for her at that time. So I'm educating myself and educating my advisor at the same time. And so fast forward to 1999, I am writing my doctoral thesis proposal and everybody's saying, well, what food are you gonna talk about? We know you're gonna do food, but what food? I had no idea. <clears throat> and so I'm not really sure. Um, maybe collard greens. And then three interesting things happened. Um, one of which, and I'm about to show you my screen in just a moment. One of which was Tiger Woods won the Masters Tournament in 1999, 98, 99. I think it was 99. If you know the Masters and you know golf, you get the coveted green jacket. You get a pocket of money, of course, but you also get to choose what meal you want. And one of his fellow golfers told him, you know, said something to the press, like he's hitting well and putting well, but tell that boy not to order fried chicken, collard greens, or whatever the hell those people eat, which landed him in a lot of hot water, okay? Then at that time, the NCAA that year for March Madness, they, um, the conglomerate of Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and KFC, won the advertising award, um, contract. So at that time, um, a hip hop colonel was on the screen. I was in another room, I heard this voice. I was like, oh my God, KFC has a black man now that they've gotten rid of Colonel Sanders. I go running in the room and I don't, I see an animated colonel and he's doing the cabbage patch, which was the dance that was popular in the black communities years ago. And their basketballs bouncing across the screen. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> whose bright idea was it to advertise basketballs, basketball, which was largely played by young black men, chicken, and have this hip hop voiceover and do this black dance? Who, whose bright idea was that? <laughs> Last thing that happened is a fraternity, a white fraternity advertised a party for MLK, um, MLK's birthday using a 40 ounce of beer and a bucket of chicken. So here I am at the dawn of the 21st century. And I'm like, how is it that black people are still dealing with the stereotype of black people? All black people love fried chicken, right? Um, you know, people are like, oh, I've never heard that stereotype. Somewhere in your life, if you are over the age of 25, you probably have and just didn't realize it. So I started out researching stereotypes of black people and chicken. And I came upon a lot of images in, <coughs> excuse me, in eBay, on eBay. Because remember this pre-internet, but still um, it didn't matter. I was able to go online and eBay um, had a lot of these, of these images, right? So I'll show you a couple of these um, of these images that are taken from my first book, um, building houses out of chicken legs, and um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and show you some of these um, images here. One second, and if there are any questions while I'm doing this, um, don't hesitate to pop right out because I can jump back into um, to where I am. So just let me know if you have any questions. Um, I thought I had it um, pulled up and I do, but there are a couple of others that I thought um, might be better to see than, than the ones that I have available right now. So just give me one second. We can wait. 
Okay. Well, yeah. And you know what? I don't even have to do it that way. I'm going to do it this way. And I'm going to share my screen. And you all let me know if you um, can see these images. Okay. Uh, let me go to share screen. All right. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. I think they've changed this feature. So, all right. So as you can see here, this Thanksgiving, can you see the Thanksgiving image? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So these are just some of the images that I gathered. This is a stereo view of a young boy um, with a chicken and, and he's stealing. This is an older man. Um, he's trying to decide, literally the caption says, he's trying to decide if he should put the watermelon down and pick up the chicken or if he should you know, do the opposite. Then there's this man who's trying to jack, grab a chicken. So I'm starting to see all of these images, right? And I'm like, okay, what's happening here? I had no idea this existed. But as a material culture, culturalist, I began to then study the images a lot more clearly, right? And I don't, if you see a pattern here, let me know. Um, if you, if you, I'm going to start back here and I'll, we'll just do these couple. Let me know if you see a pattern. Other than the fact that these are all black men. Do you see a pattern? You may have to study it a little longer. They all have buttoned up, like they're, except for the little boy, but his shirt was still a button up shirt. They all are wearing to some extent. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, excellent. That's exactly it. I started to say, what is happening here? All of these men look like they have on some sort of rich looking jacket, button up, maybe a pinafore, what have you. Um, of course, here you see he's shackled to the chicken no less. And then this man here, it says, um, I was about to have me a Christmas dinner, right? This is one of my favorite um, images from a standpoint of the visual um, uh, representation that is problematic. But yes, pretty much all of the men have on this jacket. Okay, what does this mean? There was a something called a dandy back in the early, uh, in the mid 1800s. And there was also someone called Zip Coon. Zip Coon, and I talk about all this in building houses, was essentially a character who spoke in what you call malapropisms, but thought he was dandified, well-dressed, et cetera. But he was literally, as um, that particular time period would like to argue, a buffoon. You see this actually in Birth of a Nation, the first black and white um, film, silent film, but there's a lot of, there are a lot of um, it, uh, appearances of white men in blackface. One in particular shows a black man because at that point, at that time, black people having been freed were in the majority and politically black men had more numbers, right? This is where you get black people were part of the Republican party. Back then they had more political power. And so the attempt here was to uh, make these black women appear as serv infantile, servantile. Um, in Birth of a Nation, there's a man eating a, a large turkey bone. He's got his feet on the desk. You know, they're saying, hey, these people may be free and they may dress the part, but they're absolutely not prepared to run um, our republic, right? So there was this visual attempt to emasculate um, and dehumanize uh, black men. And it wasn't just the men, it was boys as well, right? So I collected all of these images. I'll show you just a couple more. This is a postcard. A lot of these were actually sent through the mail back at that time, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, here's one of the black man lusting after a white woman. He wants the white meat, right? Um, here again, this is a, a cartoon where the black man's so dumb he doesn't know about the food. Here's another. This is uh, one of my most visually striking uh, images. So I had collected all of this ephemera, right? Um, and I said, okay, what am I going to do with this? Because I got a year into my dissertation and I said, yeah, I, I'm not interested in this anymore. Okay, because black people are more than stereotypes. Okay, um, I 
so I don't know if you all can still see my screen. Am I still mm -hmm. sharing? Mm -hmm. I am. Okay, can you see the coon chicken in? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, you have to stop when you switch. Okay, so now let me do it. This um, was probably the Coon Chicken Inn, which was a set of restaurants in um, Portland, Seattle, and Utah, I think. Um, and this was a real life bona fide, you see right here, restaurant, right? Um, so I got to a point where I just could not continue down this path of looking at Black people through a lens of a deficit model, right? Um, but one of the things I absolutely always would share is that foods tell stories and that there's a great deal of power in the storytelling through food, right? There's also this very important piece for, by um, Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie, right? She's also the author of Purple Hibiscus, but she also has a great YouTube called The Danger of the Single Story. It's a TED Talk. And she said, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they're incomplete. They make one story, the whole story, right? So that's what was happening. I was exploring these stereotypes and it was like one story, it became the whole story of black life, right? Here's Mammy's Cupboard, for example, <laughs> which is another restaurant. And a lot of times people will say, okay, well, that was back then, that's not relevant now. When President Obama won uh, election the first time, you saw these kinds of ads popping up throughout the world, um, lunch specials for Obama chicken. Um, you know, again, you have to ask yourself as a material culturalist, what is the um, connection there, right? What, is, what are the signifiers, right? How are we understanding these, um, again, these connections that are being made? Okay. So I got to that point, I got weary, I got tired. And then I found this image right here. A friend had sent it to me um, and I had put it away because my interest was not in fried chicken. I was just interested in chicken. But one day I was sitting kind of annoyed and I start looking at this image. And again, as a material culturalist, I'm looking at, I'm like, these are not reenactors. This is a period photograph, right? I'm looking at the windows, I'm looking at the, you know, it would be a lot to recreate this train for this particular festival. So I said, who are these women? And what are they doing with this food? So I called down to the Virginia Department of Tourism in Orange County, Virginia in Gordonsville. And a woman uh, who had, was working there at the time gave me a bit of the story about these women, most of which is based on rumor. Um, and then I took a trip down there and went to their lone um, room, which was their African-American Historical Society. And I found this image. And I also found an interview by a woman um, who gave an interview for the Centennial. And she said, I'm a third generation waiter carrier. My mother was a waiter carrier before me and her mother before her. And she said, my mother built our house out of chicken legs. The first one burnt down and then she rebuilt it. And I said, you know what? That's the story I want to tell. I want to tell the ways that Black women build houses out of chicken legs. How do you put your kids through school? How do you move your family into another socioeconomic bracket? How do you open up a business using food as the vehicle? All right. So now the shift of the focus of food as part of a system of objects, right? that does work beyond simply sustenance. As I've traveled, someone gave me this. They said, this may have come from the waiter carriers. I'm not really sure, but they may have used this as a way of directing people to their work. I heard and was given um, the story of May. Uh, this is a calendar entry, the story of Julia Brown, who was a businesswoman who sold chicken dinners in Corinth, Mississippi. Um, she was so fair skinned that she could travel with her daughter as her servant. And that's how they were able to sell their chickens. Um, and then there's also this image from um, that was drawn by a traveler in Richmond, Virginia, at the train station. And he says, Negro girls in the most tawdry dress and um, something offer at the station rolls and chicken legs. So this was not just one incident. 
of, of such, right? Folks at the Library of Virginia, in their attempt to kind of be sort of smart and snarky said, oh yeah, this is not a big deal. It happens at every whistle stop. Well, except that's not the story black people get told. We get told that our food is derived from scraps. We get told that um, our food is unhealthy. Our food leads to obesity and death. We don't talk about the resilience and the ways in which black caterers were the bedrock of black communities coming out of enslavement, not just caterers, but bakers, um, boarding house, lodging owners, all of these types of entrepreneurial ventures using the domestic, all that we ever hear mostly about black people is our food derives from scraps and that we were all domestics. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there because that's the history of eating while black and my discussions about cultural sustainability and so forth. But if anyone would like to ask questions, I'm I'm happy to or make comments, I'm happy to to open it up. John, you look like you have a question on your face. No, okay. Lisa's just a minute. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, my my mm -hmm. computer is slow and breaking down a little bit. But, uh, That's okay. I missed what you just said, Rita. Mm -hmm. um, I said you looked like. But you um, yeah. First of all, um, thank you. That's really. Oh. I'm going to stop my video and see if that makes my connection yeah, okay. better. Okay, no worries. Yes, that makes sense. Better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah. So first, thank you. This is really interesting and I think inspiring stuff. Um, I'm curious. You know, you, you talked a bit about um, these sort of images that you were initially collecting and that you lost interest in writing about them because of um, you, you were more interested in discussing the agency of, of black folk at the time. I wonder, do you know anything about how the caterers and servers that you documented felt about those imageries and, and how they discussed them at the time? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, how did black people feel about seeing themselves? One of the probably the one of the most prolific responders would be W.E.B. Du Bois, right, who did talk about um, issues of Black representation at the turn of the of the last century. Um, and, and I do cite him in, in building houses, but um, he talks about the ways in which um, until, unless Black people do the work of changing their own images for each other, that we cannot rely upon the larger society to do it for us, right? And this is actually echoed by Pauline Hopkins, who's the 19th century novelist I was telling you about. She was also a journalist. And in her um, publications in the early journal, The Colored American, they used to do exposés of notable Black, you know, people, notable Black reformers, notable Black, um, notable Black folks. Um, and so, you know, there was this very conscious effort, if you will, to make sure that a different story was being told. Now, overwhelmingly, when you don't control technology and the media, because even back then you had a form of media, right? Um, it, it's a hard battle to fight. And if you come up through the generations, Jim Crow, et cetera, you still see those same images. You know, one of the most poignant um, catalysts for the civil rights movement was when people saw black women, men, boys and girls being hosed down um, and also being uh, having dogs sicked on them. That changed the mindset a lot and really led toward a lot more support toward the civil rights movement. So, you know, images are everything. And representation is 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 very important. 
Could, could I just um, echo what you're saying? Hi, thank you very much for this time that you spent with us. Mm -hmm. I, used to, I used to collect black memorabilia, not a lot of it. Mm -hmm. There were some things in particular mm -hmm. um, that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And I went to, you know, a number of shows and saw various collections. And there was always a lot of attention to food mm -hmm. and um, people eating in very stereotypic ways, but also people who prepared the food, you know, um, and who became symbolic mm -hmm. of certain foods. And I, I, I got to echo what you're saying. After a while, I couldn't stand it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and once I got um, nieces and nephews uh, who were, you know, old enough to kind of see and understand, you know, what's that magnet that you have on your mm -hmm. refrigerator, Aunt Sandy? Mm -hmm. I just, I got rid of almost everything. I, I just, mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it anymore. I, I understand, um, you know, how, how, um, how, what that can do to your mind, seeing those same yeah. images over and yeah. over. Yeah, no, that's right. Thank you for that. You know, there's a, a scholar, um, and I mentioned her a moment ago, Patricia Turner, but there's also another one, Kenneth Goings. Um, both of them talk about um, Kenneth Goings' book is Mammy and Uncle Mose, and um, Patricia Turner is um, a Black collectibles book, but they're great if that's an area of interest to you um, th about contextualizing, which is a word that, you know, uh, Rita and I were talking about before you all came on, but they put these, um, these, these images in a larger um, historical environment or historical context, right? Um, and, and they really do do the work that has to be done to sort of speak to them. They can be problematic, especially when you're working with them every day, right? Um, so just um, because uh, some of you may or may not um, be clear about what we're talking about, and then I'll jump it back into Eating While Black and tell you how that came about because it's a direct offshoot of building houses. Um, so very quickly, let me um, go to um, the Gold Dust Twins the color conventions, gold tusk twins. Um, so we're talking about, okay, because we're talking about stereotypes. So I just wanted to, um, oh, I know. Okay, a subtlety is what I want. I just want to subtlety, Kara Walker. Um, so at the end of um, building houses, I kind of turned my attention midway through and talk about um, the ways in which Black people, like Chris Rock as a comedian um, and others, have used the stereotype of chicken in a way that either empowers or raises questions about Black culture. One of the people who I also talk about is the artist Kara Walker, who's an African-American woman and always has some very highly controversial, provocative images um, that she has created. And so I'm gonna share my screen very quickly. Um, and he, I'm sharing this because she had, and, and if you can capture the, the um, URL, this is a very short video, but she, when the Domino Sugar Factory was going out of business in, uh, Williamsburg, New York, they contracted her to create a sculpture, all right? She created a subtlety, okay, the sugar babies. And this um, particular piece, um, wow. not only, I'm not going to play it, but I just want to fast forward through it. It talks about, and it takes on the issue of sugar in Black communities. Namely, it takes on the issue of Black enslaved people in Jamaica working in the sugar fields, right? So you would go in and you would smell this sick syrupy smell um, in the warehouse. It was hot. It was in the middle of June when she crafted this, this piece. They created a mold where you can see the Black woman as a sphinx, um, bare breast, buttocks in, uh, raised in the back. So it's a very sexualized um, piece to represent 
the ways in which black women while enslaved were sexualized, exploited, used as mammy figures, et cetera. Here's another side image of it. This piece was made out of fondant, sugar, and, um, and also styrofoam. But one of the other things she had in here were sugar babies, little black molasses um, like images of little black children. And when they started to melt, at, at the exhibit. It was a very nasty, there you go, right there. So these are the sugar babies, right? And so alongside all of these other stereotypes, um, the gold dust twins, you know, you're seeing all of this kind of imagery around food. <laughs> all right. When I was presenting on building houses and I'll do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> Several things were happening. Rita, you keep mentioning uh, my book, Redefining Food Ways in a Changing World. The title, the first part of the title is Taking Food Public, Redefining Food Ways in a Changing World. Because what we saw happening were all of these big conversations around food. And so we said, hey, Let's put them all in a compendium. My co-author and me, Carol Cunahan, who's an anthropologist, we said, let's bring these conversations to the forefront because there's so many. They're about environment. They're about the triple bottom line. Um, they're about culture. They're about all these areas, but culture actually wasn't being talked as much, right? It was mostly around the burgeoning of the new food movement back in the early 2000s, right? What do I mean by that? Everybody wanted to grow a garden. Everyone wanted to tell everybody else how to eat. Bittman, Pollen, King's Lover, everybody knows best how to eat. And what I saw happening is people were coming up to me saying, how do I get Black people to eat better? And my response is like, so why is that your issue? Who are you, right? Who, who are you exactly? I mean, just help me. Are you a physician? Are you, who, why is this your concern? I had folks telling me things like, oh my God, the closest you can get to heaven on earth is to grow your own food. For whom? Because for hundreds of years, some people were forced to grow food for other people. And then even after they were uh, released from enslavement, they were denied 40 acres and a mule and other things that would help them build resources and wealth. So for who are these people who should feel like it's heaven on earth to share crop when their grandparents share cropped and their great grandparents share crop? Who are these people who should feel like hands in the soil is the epitome of life? <coughs> and then the other thing that was happening, dollar stores started getting refrigeration. I was always in the dollar tree because my daughter was always going to some crazy birthday party and I needed something for the children, right? Or, or just some little goodie bag. And so I noticed over time that Dollar Trees were starting to sell food. And I'm like, why aren't we telling people this? What's happening? Why aren't we telling people they can buy food from the Dollar Tree? Okay, so then um, in uh, sometime in 2019, um, a, a black woman was on the train in DC on the Metro and she was eating. And another person saw this and took a picture of her and posted on Twitter and said, um, and I'm kind of quoting, when you're on your morning commute and you see at Wamada employee in uniform eating on the train, I thought we were not allowed to eat on the train. This is unacceptable. I hope at Wamada responds. And so she said, when I asked the employee about this, the employee's response was worry about yourself. Okay. Well, as it turns out, the employee was absolutely right because because she was an employee, she knew that the ban had been lifted on being able to eat, listen to music and other things on the train. So she was perfectly within her right. The question became, why are we shaming people for going about a quotidian act, eating? And, and I saw this happening over and over again in the comments that I just finished telling you all of that, right? I, I saw people literally shaming people. I was just on Twitter yesterday and or Instagram or something, and a woman was um, 
making a recipe that she sh she deigned to share online. Well, she used canned green beans. Oh my gosh. You would have thought she murdered someone right there in living color. People came for her so ridiculously. Oh my God, there's no nutritional value in, in green beans. They're just none. Oh my God, I'm gonna have high blood pressure looking at your recipe. And so I finally just couldn't take it anymore. And I said, you know, the amount of food shaming going on here is just incredible because she's making choices for her life and for the life of her people. She just happened to share it with us. I said, but listening to you all, people would be absolutely horrified and ashamed to eat canned food. Even if that's the only thing they have left, they don't want to be shamed psychologically on social media. So as my colleague said, and then I'm going to stop right after this, she said, would be ethical consumers, because we're all consumers, right? approach every alternative food campaign as a kind of moral, social, ecological litmus test. To be a good person, you must eat vegetarian, eat vegan, eat organic, eat local, eat biodynamic, eat fair trade, eat authentic, eat dot, dot, dot. I applaud these individual efforts to challenge the industrial agri-food system. I do not applaud their tendency to reduce moral life to a set of rigid choices that if made it correct, can make me good. And that's what I saw happening. I, I, people were and still are attributing food to somehow being morally correct and upright citizens, i.e. clean. So what does that mean? The rest of us eat dirty? I mean, we're all eating dirty. Whether you're eating it out of the ground or you're eating it from some, you don't know what's in your food supply and the soil is destroyed, right? Um, we've got toxic water waste. We've got all kinds of, none of us are eating clean. You might eat differently. Everyone who wants to have a label, I'm a pescatarian, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that, you know, it really, it puts people in a way. And then we don't really necessarily think about the elderly who are probably most often food insecure or just don't eat while they're trying to age in place <laughs> because they don't have any company. They don't have anyone to eat with. They don't, you know, they may get meals on wheels and talk that person to death because that's the only person they see and talk to all week. Um, so there are lots of different variations. We don't consider the fact that people on medication of all sorts, including mental health, and sometimes that adds weight and sometimes that increases your appetite. Um, we just don't think about the myriad ways that people eat, that not everyone wants to eat Mediterranean. And some people in terms of cultural sustainability are migrating to this or other countries. And the only thing that sustains them is to eat food that they're familiar with, whether that's fufu or if that's yucca or that that's plantain or whatever. Um, we need to stop trying to tell people how to live their very limited lives on this planet. So I'm gonna stop there and let you guys um, pick it up. All right. Questions, comments. Yeah, we've got a lot to think about. Are you familiar with, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Rita. Hi, Rita. It's Mallory. Go on, Mallory. Hi. Um, I just have to say, I, um, I have a passion and love for food and furniture and um, the home and the house is, means everything. All the rooms, all the spaces, all the objects and the stories and lives they tell. I used to do estate sales. So sitting with someone as they're going through the garage or their basement, um, and hearing about the stories of everything that they own is one of those things that I truly treasure. And I feel as a society, we're, we're, we're getting further and further from um, values that I think uh, will help us to sustain that tenet of like really, truly really as, uh, mm -hmm. as an experiment of America democracy as it is. I mean, to your point of the shame, I, 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 I don't know how we get as a society, if we're looking at it from a cultural sustainability standpoint, I, I know I mentioned this even when I was doing my capstone for the MAX program, which was um, my husband had worked in restaurants and there was a big thing about, you know, knowing the farm, local farm, and the whole elite mentality that comes to how we eat. Um, and yet there would be this disconnect with how people treat each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like even mm -hmm. just the servers giving you that plate, 
So mm -hmm. how is, I, I, I just am curious about your thoughts and being so deeply in this world and having an understanding of the, like you're saying, this broad understanding that we need to have for giving each other that space for how we show up. I'm just curious, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts as far as like, how can we use food and food ways to create mm -hmm. more opportunities to create those spaces in which we have more opportunities to, to, it's like, it's like, I don't want to shame the people who are the shamers, but to help level set or help us create that more open and less elite mentality that comes to how we look at how we eat. I don't know if that makes any sense, no, but it makes, it makes a lot of good sense. It's a good question. Thank you. I don't know. And I'll tell you why. Um, you know, the work that I do is about trying to make black people, bring black people to an awareness of our food cultures and histories. I think that's a form of black liberation. And that's my, that's my goal. Um, because the shaming that takes place in black communities is systematic of a larger set of issues around who black people are in this country, but not just in this country, but throughout the diaspora. To reduce our culture to scraps means that you ignore the levels of ingenuity and survival that we had to use during 300 years of enslavement. We were brought here because of our agricultural knowledge. There's no way in the world you can bring people because of their very skill and they're not gonna use that same skill to survive. It's insanity. Most of our conversations are focused on, for example, plantations that look like gone with the wind. People are forgetting that black folks existed on farms. Some black folks were free. We, some of us were urban, some of us were rural. It, it's just much more complex, but to have to dissect the complexities means that we somehow have to take time to understand black history and culture. And it's so much easier to wrap it all up as all black people eat soul food, right? Okay, so that's one part. The second part to your question, the reason I say I don't know is because um, I'm thankful last year, last June, my my book was uh, the recipient of a James Beard Award. And if you know the James Beard Foundation, they are notable for awarding um, mostly to chefs, right? For their fine dining, white tablecloth environments. Um, them along with Michelin are some of the top prices that you can get in food states. So they created a new category in the, uh, the category overall is the media awards, which we happened the day before nobody cares about us. We're like the B roll of the, of these, like the Academy awards, right? We're the off screen, you know, awards. Um, but um, we, uh, so there was a category on um, food advocacy and um culture, I think, and, and so my book one. Okay, why am I telling you that? Um, and thank you, by the way, for that, uh, for, the, for the applause. The reason I'm telling you that is because when those nominations go out, I don't care how you feel about James Beard. When that nomination goes out and you are a nominee, I, I saw it happen last year because I was paying attention. And this year, people forget all their sort of problems that they have. Why? Because there's still a reason and a benefit to being an awardee for anything. It's great to win an award. And when you've worked hard, such as to open a restaurant and to serve particular kinds of food, whether they're your cultural food ways or what have you, or you've written a book or an article or a short story or whatever, and, and you're being recognized by one of the top, you know, um, uh, areas, you know, uh, awarding uh, uh, companies in the in the world. Sure, of course. So that's to my point. I, I don't know because you have to get past the human element, right? And and the human element is very real. People like being appreciated. People like having their um, their hard work recognized, right? Um, our shine was dull because Taylor Swift was in town. <laughs> That <laughs> last, uh, you know, in June, but but the point is, still, we had our own good time. But yeah, it was fascinating to watch people who I had talked with who had just rah, 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 found out they were nominated. Well, well you know, I want to rethink. <laughs> <laughs> and you go fault people for that because that means that there could be that could translate into more customers and more more revenue or survival of your restaurant or what have you, and and more book sales or whatever you want to call it or what have you. So.
Yeah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, and more visibility and vis Absolutely. visibility in a positive way. Absolutely. As you Period. said, is yeah. an important thing that it brings Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Yep. Well, I see that the unfortunate hour is 7.31, and we're supposed mm -hmm. to allow Psyche to go and listen to Taylor Swift or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? um, but I just hate to let you go, Psyche. This is wonderful. I mean, your work is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I want to say again, I think that one of the things that makes your work such a a good example of sustainability, cultural sustainability, something working toward in uh, supporting culture is that it is so accessible. When the public can read your book, it's going to make a difference. It's not just, as I said, I think earlier before we started, scholars speaking to scholars and making up a new word every other sentence. <laughs> and and that's like the oral history narratives can be that can be written and digested um, because they're in plain language. Uh, your ideas aren't plain; they're on another plane, if I could say. Uh, yeah. They're really great. They give us models for research. Well, and if I could just close by saying something to all of you who who may please do. Speak in the tongue that's going to be comfortable for you. I write for my mom. And if my mother can read it, then I feel like I've passed the litmus test. And the scholar told me one time, she said, you're going to learn to speak many languages. One for the academy, one at home, one with, for example, your children, you know, all of this. Um, I'll just say this in closing because I know we have to wrap up. But, you know, like Toni Morrison said, I write under siege because I'm a mother and my child comes first and foremost. Um, so that means I'm up early, I'm at late at night, but I'm always hearing the voice of my mom. And this is kind of cliche as your grandmom or whatever, but it's true because my mom talked about sucking a chicken bone dry. And that's one of my articles, right? Um, I talk about related, eating in, in, in cross-cultural households with my, my ex-husband and stuff. So I try to write stuff that I want to read. <laughs> Right. Really, I, I want to and, and I love the material world and I love the questions about food in the material world. I love black people and um, and, I, you know, and I and so I write to my family and for anyone else who is interested in reading what I have to say. So thank you all so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's just been been great. And keep at it. We're looking for more. Oh, great. Thank you. Stay tuned for the domestic interiors. Oh.